Hello everyone and welcome back to Creation Myths. Today I have a new creation myth for you and really interesting about this one, this is actually a new creation myth. Most claims that creationists use, even in the 2020s, are just kind of rehashed versions of things from like the 1980s, if not earlier. It's very rare that we get to talk about an actual new idea here. But as we'll see in just a minute, this concept, patriarchal drive, is a genuinely new idea to come out of young earth creationism just within the last six years or so, which makes it really interesting. It's something I've wanted to cover for a while, and I'm really happy that I'm finally getting around to it. So let's talk about why patriarchal drive is, like always, a whole bunch of nonsense. Before we go any further, we have to explain what patriarchal drive is. What do those words even mean? The underlying idea here is actually some real science, right? What we know about specifically how human males reproduce, and in general, males with testes that make sperm, but we're specifically talking about humans, is that because you're constantly dividing cells in the male germline, uh, your cells are dividing and copying their DNA over the entire reproductive lifespan of a male, which is potentially their whole life. So as men age, we see more and more mutations in these germline cells that are constantly propagating because they just have more and more cell divisions, and therefore they copy their DNA more and more times as they age. This means that sperm in older men have more mutations than sperm in younger men. Now, applying this to a young earth biblical framework, right, the biblical patriarchs had kids when they were hundreds of years old. Some of them did, not all, but some of them lived into the hundreds of years and had kids at those ages. So if you take what we know about mutations in the male human germline and apply it to that situation, we would think that the kids of these biblical patriarchs probably had a whole bunch of mutations inherited via their dad's older sperm right in that single generation. That's the idea of patriarchal drive, right? So it's the number of mutations, this excessive number of mutations that appears in the population relatively quickly due to the age of the fathers, right? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about patriarchal drive. Like I said at the top, this is actually a very new idea. The term was coined in 2018 by Carter, Lee, and Sanford in this piece from the Proceedings of the International Conference on Creationism. Now, you probably recognize some of those names. That's Dr. Rob Carter and Dr. John Sanford. Uh, that's Rob Carter of CMI, John Sanford, Genetic Entropy, John Sanford. Uh, Stephen Lee, the middle author, I don't know who that is. Sorry, Stephen, I don't know who you are. Um, but this paper was not specifically about patriarchal drive, uh, but they did include a section saying, hey, this is a thing that possibly operates that, you know, we should look into further. And then in 2019, Dr. Rob Carter did just that. He published this paper in the Journal of Creation, Patriarchal Drive in the Early Post-Flood Population. And this is what we're going to base this entire video on, because I will tell you, Patriarchal drive is not a well-done, well-studied creationist concept. It's not like something like genetic entropy or irreducible complexity, where you have a lot of people talking about these things. The two papers that I'm showing you right here, this is it for patriarchal drive. So we are going to focus on the 2019 paper by Dr. Rob Carter as like kind of this is kind of the canonical version of patriarchal drive. So this is what we're going to deal with today. So again, any figures that I show you, any excerpts of text that I show you on screen, it's all going to be from this 2019 paper by Dr. Rob Carter. Before we get into why this concept is wrong, we also need to talk about why this idea even exists. So the basic idea is that creationists have to explain how to get all of the existing genetic diversity that we see in Homo sapiens today from Noah's family when they get off the ark about 4,000 years ago. And we also, from that very small pool of genomes, need to explain Neanderthal 
and Denisovan variation, because in almost all young Earth creationist models, Neanderthals and Denisovans are post-flood descendants from Noah's family. And we know, because we have lots of Neanderthal DNA and less, but still some Denisovan DNA, we know that they're highly divergent from Homo sapiens. And because all of those groups, extant Homo sapiens and the extinct groups, are post-flood descendants from Noah, we need to explain all of that variation within a very short time frame. This requires a lot of mutations, very fast. There are creationist models like created heterozygosity that say, no, 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 we don't need mutations. But almost all young Earth creationists, including people who endorse created heterozygosity, like Dr. Rob Carter, say that mutations play a role in generating that diversity, like what we see here in this figure, which is actually a figure from one of Rob Carter's papers. So basically, this concept is like the claim uh, that the per-generation mutation rate equals the long-term nucleotide substitution rate, right? Patriarchal drive is an attempt to explain all of this genetic variation in a relatively short amount of time. In addition to that, it's also an attempt to show that the biblical narrative, as interpreted by young Earth creationists as a literal story with literal people who had kids when they were hundreds of years old, it's an attempt to show that that is compatible with what we observe today about human genetics, right? So those are the two goals of patriarchal drive. One, you need a source of mutations to generate all the diversity we see. And two, we want to show that what we see today is compatible with the story that they take out of the Bible, right? Is there a mechanism that gets you from that story to existing genetic diversity. Patriarchal drive, Dr. Carter will claim, is part of that answer. So now let's get to the fun part, why patriarchal drive is wrong. And I'm going to give you four reasons, any one of which I think is enough to invalidate the idea, but I'm going to give you all four. Uh, the first one is very simple. It's that patriarchal drive is made up. Uh, I'm going to blame this on Dr. Rob Carter. I think it's mostly his idea. Uh, the paper where it was coined had two other authors, but then Dr. Carter really takes this idea and runs with it in uh, that single author paper uh, from 2019. So I really think this is all basically Dr. Rob Carter just coming up with like, oh, what would happen if you had somebody who was 300 years old and they had kids and blah, blah, blah. I really do think it's Carter kind of running with this. So I'm going to blame it on him and say he kind of made this up. He came up with this. Now, what he does in the paper that uh, I've mentioned, that 2019 paper, this is a figure from that paper that shows mutation models, uh, three different models of mutations, a linear model, uh, an exponential model, and then kind of a slower, uh, I think that's also a linear model. What he does, basically, is he says that the best approach to doing this, the, the approach he seems to endorse in this paper, is to take the known human male germline mutation rates for ages 20 to 50, right? So like we've documented kind of how many mutations build up in the germline in human males during that age. You take that, um, but then he extrapolates an exponential increase in that mutation rate from, for ages 50 to 600 going out. And he, he stops his models at 600 uh, years old for these biblical patriarchs. So basically he starts with the empirical kind of observations and then does an exponential growth uh, after that, which strikes me as you're just kind of making things up because you need it to be that shape to work with the math you want to do. Um, he doesn't provide evidence to support this extrapolation. I think if you asked Dr. Carter, he would say that he does provide evidence to support this extrapolation, but I do not think that the evidence he provides, that there is an increase in uh, mutations in the male germline through age 50, uh, I don't think that gives him the foundation to build an exponentially increasing model going out to age 600. I think he's kind of going out on a limb there. So that's the first thing. This is basically just a made-up idea, I think, from Dr. Rob Carter, but it could be the other two uh, authors on that first paper also playing a role. The second problem is that Dr. Carter, in his 2019 paper, ignores processes that would have the opposite effect on mutation accumulation within the human male germline. So basically he emphasizes mutations, 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 but I could just as easily say that the opposite thing happens. Watch, here's what we can do. 
Male germline cells compete with each other. We know this is the case. And there's lots of variation even in a single male. So at a certain age in a single individual, some sperm from certain germline lineages are going to have more mutations than other sperm from other lineages. And we know that these different lineages of cells actually compete in a way that's similar to natural selection. So you could have something like selection against harmful mutations that occur in one lineage relative to another. You could have one lineage that finds one or two really beneficial mutations and you get a selective sweep that kind of takes over and erases all of the mutations that have happened in the other lineages. Like what would happen in a population of individuals if those processes are operating in the germline, then that's going to exert downward pressure on the buildup of mutations in those germline cells, leading to offspring inheriting few mutations relative to what you might expect given the father's age, even if you draw it out, you know, to 600 years, as Dr. Carter does. Now, here's the interesting thing about that stuff that I just described, those mechanisms that we know operate in the germline. This is actually mentioned in the paper by Dr. Carter, but he doesn't go the next step and draw the obvious conclusion related to how that would affect genetic diversity within those germline lineages. So he wrote in the paper, I'm going to read what's highlighted in yellow here, from studies of modern men, we have learned that differences can arise in different spermatogonial lineages within a single man, meaning one parent can produce greatly differing offspring depending on which spermatogonial lineage contributed to each child. In fact, some spermatogonial lineages can take over in an almost cancer-like or selection-like scenario. So he's basically saying the stuff that I just described happens. You have competition. You could even have things like selective sweeps. But he doesn't go the next step and talk about how that might affect the buildup of mutations within those tissues. So you could just as easily take the processes that he describes and say, and this is going to limit mutations rather than causing them to increase exponentially. That's a perfectly fair argument, and Dr. Rob Carter doesn't engage with it at all. So those two reasons why you shouldn't put too much stock in this paper are fine, but now we're going to get into the two that I really like, the really good ones that make you go, no, 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 no way. The first of these that we'll talk about is Dr. Carter's absolutely bananas model for mutation accumulation. And it's really interesting and kind of funny considering what he says earlier in the paper about mutation accumulation and patriarchal drive. Early in the paper, he says, quote, reading from right here, there is no need to force the model to generate evidence of patriarchal drive. If the effect is real, it should appear naturally once the proper factors are being measured within the models already in existence. In other words, he's saying we don't need to come up with some new model that we're going to force it to show evidence of patriarchal drive. Standard genetics models that, as he describes it, you know, young earth creationists have a bunch of models that we use, and we can use those models, tweak them a little bit, like have the longer lifespans, and if patriarchal drive is real and our parameters are realistic, then we should see the evidence of patriarchal drive in the output from these models. That's what Dr. Carter says about how patriarchal drive should show up in these models. If you have realistic parameters, then it should just show up as a matter of course. Now let's look at how his mutation accumulation model actually works. Here's how he does mutation accumulation. And again, I'm going to read this. It's a little bit technical, but then we're going to talk about it in plain English, and you're going to see just how bananas this is. Okay? So, again, reading. For each model run, an array with n rows and 100,000 columns was created, and all values were initialized to zero. So, no mutations. A position counter incremented for each new mutation in the population. So, you go linearly from beginning to end. If at any time the total number of mutations exceeded the width of the array, an extra 1,000 bits were added to each row and initialized to zero. So you get to the end, you just keep adding, in effect, nucleotide sites. When a boy was born, his father's row was copied to his. He then received X new mutations, so X bits were set to 1, indicating they were mutated, starting at the last position, plus 1. In this way, every column in the array contained a unique mutation inherited from a specific ancestor. 
So let's talk about this in plain English here. What this is talking about is you start with basically a sequence of 100,000 nucleotides. They're either zero or one, not mutated or mutated. And you start at the front end and then you go through that sequence. And for every individual, you start with a previous one picked up. So you have some number of mutations occurring in one individual. And then after the last mutation there, you go to the next individual and some number of mutations occur. And then after that last mutation, you go to the next individual and you build from there. So every individual gets some non-overlapping series of mutations in this model. Now, what happens when you get to the end of your 100,000 bases? Well, you just add another 1,000 and you just keep going. So in this way, you're going to have an infinitely large uh, genome size, essentially, or I guess I should say chromosome. He's modeling an artificial chromosome here as he describes it in the paper. So the things that are going on in this model, there's no selection. There's no natural selection. He does describe genetic drift operating in his model, but no natural selection. There is no convergence right? So you can't have the same mutation occur in more than one individual. There are no back mutations. Once a site either does or does not mutate, you move past it and you never revisit that site. So there's no back mutations. And we have an infinitely increasing genome size. You get to the end of the line, you just keep adding bases where more and more mutations can happen. Does this sound like a realistic model of mutation accumulation to anyone? Is an infinitely growing chromosome part of any realistic biological system? In practice, is natural selection not happening at all? Is convergence not a thing? Are there no back mutations? None of these parameters are realistic. And despite what Rob Carter says earlier in the paper about how, oh, you know, you have realistic parameters and it should just fall into place and you'll see the patriarchal drive, what it looks like here is the model is designed to show an exponentially increasing number of mutations as time passes, given, you know, no selection, which would remove variation, no convergence, which would reduce the rate of new mutations, no back mutation, which would have the effect of removing mutations from the population, and of course, an infinitely growing genome size, so you never revisit old sites, right? You just keep on going and adding more bases and more mutations to your artificial chromosome. None of these parameters are, are realistic at all, and they completely invalidate the point, which is to show, or I should say one of the points, which is to show that this concept of patriarchal drive is a realistic thing that we can expect within a broader, but let's call it a realistic, young earth model of human populations and human population genetics. Clearly with these parameters, that's not the case. But let's put all of this aside. Let's assume that the mutation model is fine, that there's an empirical basis for everything Rob Carter does. Let's say none of the problems I've described so far exist. Patriarchal drive still fails for one very simple reason. And that reason is this. It doesn't solve the problem it's supposed to solve. Remember, patriarchal drive is one, an attempt to take the pattern of diversity that you see in humans and explain how you get it in the span of 4,000 years from the small founder population of Noah's family, right? That's one of the things patriarchal drive is supposed to accomplish. It doesn't do it. Why not? Because there's no Neanderthals nor Denisovans mentioned in this model. Neanderthals and Denisovans are also not yet part of this model. That's a quote from the paper from Rob Carter. What are we doing if we're modeling how to get from Noah's family to modern genetic diversity? Virtually all young earth creationists agree that Neanderthals and Denisovans are descendants from Noah, right? They are post-flood branches of homo, homo sapiens that have gone extinct. I know it's inconvenient for young earth creationists to have to deal with the extreme divergence of those populations, but you can't just leave them out of your models and pretend that that's okay. You have to include those. And if you don't include them, then your model doesn't solve the problem it's supposed to solve. Your model doesn't explain how you get from Noah to the modern world because you're leaving out a giant chunk of the genetic diversity that you have to generate in that time frame of, again, only about 4,000 years. By leaving Neanderthals and Denisovans out of his model, Rob Carter shows that he's not really trying to solve the problem, right? This is not a serious attempt to be able to explain post-flood genetics. If it was, it would include Neanderthals and Denisovans, but he doesn't.
It doesn't solve the problem. And for that reason alone, everything Rob Carter describes in this paper, his model and all the justifications for it, are hollow. They don't accomplish what they're supposed to accomplish, and it's not more complicated than that. Now, there's one more thing we have to talk about before we wrap this up, and it's this, the raw mat paper. What am I talking about? Well, I said at the beginning that the 2019 paper from Rob Carter is really it for literature on patriarchal drive, but that's not actually completely true because in 2020, amateur YouTube young earth creationist, former breatharian and raw honey aficionado raw mat put a paper on the internet called Antediluvian Patriarch De Novo Mutation Rate. And this is the heading for that paper that he put on the internet as a PDF. This is the heading. You'll notice a few things. It has the name PLOS Biology, which is a journal, and the logo for the PLOS family of journals. That is a lie. This paper was never published in PLOS Biology or any other PLOS journal. You also see a DOI number here. That doesn't work. I don't know if it ever did, but it doesn't anymore. It's to everything about this paper is just phony. By the way, once this was caught and uh, it was pointed out that like he's making stuff up, he removed both the PLOS Biology logo and the DOI number. Um, I don't know if you could find this on the internet now, but the later versions that you could still track down uh, did not have either of those things. So remember, folks, anytime you find something funny from a young earth creationist, take a screenshot because screenshots are forever. But back to Raw Matt's paper because this is amazing. And by the way, this is not serious. This is the opposite of serious. It's just hilarious. I'm going to show you some of the parts of the paper. And what I want you to do is just pause. Just pause the video and just read. Try to make sense of the nonsense that Ramat is writing in this paper. So here's part of it. This is the, the beginning of the introduction. And I want to point out here that the formatting is his, right? This center aligned weird stuff with like, th this is a screenshot right there. That's a screenshot. This is, I don't know what's going on there. This is like a little screen, a little picture actually of text from another paper with a reference there. Like this is how it was formatted as a paper from PLOS. Uh, here's another part of it that just the method section, like again, pause this and read it. The highlighting right there, that's his. The purple hyperlink, that's his. This is how it was put online. There's one more thing I want to show you about this because it was amazing. Uh, at some point, somebody realized that there was a Google doc of this paper that was editable and that link was shared around and a bunch of people, myself included, edited it uh, to try to like fix this monstrosity of a paper. And by the time people were done with it, barely a word of Raw Matt's original text remained. This is a representative sample of what that paper looked like post editing. You can see the comments, the substitutions, the deletions, there's all kinds of stuff going on here from many different people, including, hey, our friend, Dapper Dinosaur in here, and Just a Walking Fish, look at that. Uh, all of us just in there, just having fun, trying to save Raw Matt's monstrosity of a paper. Again, this last thing about Raw Matt's paper has nothing to do with the broader concept of patriarchal drive and whether it's right or wrong. It's just a really funny addendum to this topic. So we will leave it at that. Patriarchal drive, recall, is just another young earth creationist attempt to explain human genetic diversity in a young earth framework, this time specifically including the effects of those hundreds of years old patriarchs in the immediate post-flood era. Like every other attempt, it fails because it's completely made up, it involves completely unrealistic parameters, and like so many other young earth creationist models, it doesn't take into account Neanderthal or Denisovan genetic diversity, which you have to explain because they are, according to young earth creationists, post-flood descendants from Noah. So, patriarchal drive. This is, like all the other things we talk about here, a creation myth. Thank you all for watching. Please hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you're not subscribed, leave a comment, share this video, add it to your list of 
creationist debunks, uh, do all the algorithm friendly things on my behalf. I'll also take a moment here to remind everybody that I recently enabled channel memberships. Uh, if you are a channel member at any level, you get immediate access to my pre-recorded videos when I upload them, instead of having to wait for the public release date, which is Wednesday nights uh, on weeks when I don't do a live show. At the second level of membership or higher, I'm going to give you a shout out and thank you for your support. So Ian Chen and Charles Payette, thank you for your support. I appreciate it. That's it for today, everybody. Thank you again for watching. Remember, don't get fooled.